Yeah, I'm Chris Hill here with Bill Mann and Andy Cross. Thanks for being here, guys. Hey Chris, sure. How are you? The volatility continues. We're going to be taking your questions about stocks, about investing in this volatile market. And if you're just getting started investing, we want to help you out. We have a free investing starter kit. It's a great 15 page report, walks you through how to get started investing, and it includes five stocks from our investing team. And it's free. You can find it at fool.com slash start. Check that out when you get a chance. Uh, Bill Mann, let me start with you. Uh, what do you see when you look out at the market? I mean, yesterday we had the 2,000 point Dow Jones drop, making all the headlines. Yeah. Market bouncing back today. Are we sure? Is it? Yeah. You know, check back with me in 20 minutes. Yeah. But as of this moment in time, the market is bouncing back. What mm -hmm. goes through your mind on a day like today? Well, what you see on a day like today when you have a pretty sharp snapback, if it holds, is you know, there's that old adage about you know, if you miss the, the best 20 days of the, the stock market that your, your returns will dramatically under, yeah. underperform over time. Well, usually those best days come in the middle of downdrafts. And this may, you know, last Monday was one of those days and this may be another one. Yeah, they come right around the worst days come also the best days, as Bill yeah. said, very apropos, I think, a snapback, and we're seeing that a little bit today. Some news this morning uh, kind of started us off with perhaps some help on the fiscal side. We saw, yeah. we've seen a lot of help on the monetary side, well, a lot, and we likely will see more, but now we might see some from the, from the government uh, in D.C. acting to um, help consumers, which is a good sign. Yeah. Uh, we also saw a, a lot of the major airline carriers come out um, with reports of uh, in some cases, uh, pulling back on their capacity, um, canceling some routes. As far as into the summer, mm -hmm. uh, we also saw some airline CEOs saying, I'm going to take a pay cut. Um, how bad is this? Because I think at this point, if you're an investor, you've been paying attention in the market, you're used to um, announcements from a timing basis being pushed maybe two months out. Yeah. Um, major tech company cancels their conference, which was scheduled for May. This is airlines saying, we're looking into July and August and we're, pu we're pulling back. We can't see anything. Yeah, I mean, if you think about where the airlines are now versus where they were 10 years ago, uh, the last time you know, they went through a real crisis during the financial crisis when almost all of them, I believe, except for Delta and Southwest, ended up in bankruptcy. These companies are much, much better off mm -hmm. today. They are much less levered. You know, they, have, they, they, they are much more levered towards operating expenses than they are fixed costs than they were uh, in the past. There may be actually some things that they will benefit from. For example, uh, airlines, airlines buy billions of gallons of jet fuel, and they buy it in forwards, right? So I would imagine that we're setting up for a pretty good 2021, 2022 for the airlines. Yeah, it's it's just more evidence that um, corporations, and we haven't seen the end of it. I mean, the, no, this sure we're, we're still in, a, in, in, a, in a, a medical situation, in a health situation that is really uncertain. So we see a lot, we saw what happened around New Rochelle in New York with what Mayor, uh, Governor Cuomo decided to do and basically bring the National Guard to really kind of like help focus um, some quarantine efforts there for, the, for what we've seen up in New York. So we'll, we'll see more of those and, and I think and they're scary. Well, I mean, they're scary, and you yeah. want, as we talked about Chris yesterday, you want you want leaders who are transparent and as open as they can be, and and certainly travel. We've seen that what's happened on the cruise lines as well too. I mean, bookings are down 30, 40 percent on the cruise line just over the course of a week at some of the cruise ships. So uh, they are getting out in front of the news and trying to be transparent and saying we're going to cut capacity, yeah. and uh, and that's impacting what you've seen a little bit of a bounce on the airline stocks today. So yeah. that's good to see for them, and that's the kind of leadership you want. From your, from your CEO. One of the most interesting uh, announcements that I saw was American Airlines was announcing that it's cutting 10% of its summer peak routes yeah. internationally, 55% to Asia, which tells you that they are taking this extremely seriously. For them to, for them to put out what is truly their main heavy season and say, we're already pulling back, that actually speaks yeah. volumes for what's going yeah. on. Uh, we'll get into some more company and industry news in a minute, but I wanted to uh, just ask you a couple of questions. As investors, as experienced investors, yes, I'm saying you're old, um, <laughs> but when you think back to 2008, 2009, 
when you think back to 2000, 2001, and Bill, I'll just start with you. Are there any lessons that you pull forward to today that you went through back then that help you navigate the volatility that we're seeing right now? Well, there are two things. One is that people have to recognize and just embrace the fact that it is almost impossible to understand the stress of a drawdown of this nature until you live through one. And a lot of people who are in the stock market now weren't really investing when it, even in 2008. So one thing that I took from the past was find a way to remind yourself what that felt like. Because what's, whatever's going on in your mind right now, this is your risk tolerance. This is your capacity to withstand fear in the markets when you've watched your portfolio drop a fair amount. And so much of the of the drop in the selling is just across the board. So you have, especially now, more so than even back then, you have yeah. algorithms, you have traders, you have just tons of activity in there. You have there. index funds, which are a much huger part of the- Gigantic, you know, gigantic absolutely, yeah. right, Bill? So you just have this, you have a lot more automated trading now than we had back then. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that in the in the, in the the market, I think. Um, but you're seeing just, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you own, it almost is, is all down, maybe with the exception of Zoom. So like, you just have, <laughs> you have this like, broad selling and people just kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. So as we saw from 2008, 2009, 2009, which by the way, we celebrated the anniversary of yesterday, the, yesterday the, the of the basically the bottom of the market during that crisis. And then the stocks rebounded dramatically up two, three, four times in value. So um, th at some point this will pass as Chris, you and I talked about yesterday and you want to be in the market. Unfortunately, what we saw so many individual investors who got out of the market in 2008, 2009, never actually went back in. So they yeah. lost just all this monumental gains we saw during that, yeah. from that time. What do you think? Did March 9th, 2009 or March 9th, 2020 feel worse? Uh, they felt equally bad. Yeah. I mean, March 9th was uh, just such a painful day. There was so much red. Yeah. Um, I suppose in some ways, what we saw in March uh, 9th of 2009, um, was almost, I don't want to use the word defeatist, but it right. had come at the end of a longer yes. span of time. Nine what we're, of, yeah. what we're right. seeing right now is happening much more quickly. Um, and I want to throw a chart yeah. up, uh, if our producer Dan Boyd can, can put this up on the screen, and we talked about this yesterday, Andy, but you look at the rise of the market um, since the mid-1950s, we see those huge drops, uh, particularly in the early 2000s and uh, around 2008, 2009. Yeah. Um, and it's painful. You know, we got people asking questions like, should I just sell everything and wait to jump back in? Um, but it's so hard to know when to time the well, bottom yeah, that wait, you almost yeah. shouldn't even try. Yeah. Wait for what? Well, and you shouldn't try. Yeah, exactly, Bill. Exactly. Yeah. When do you know when to get back in? No one can really time the market. They if they tell you they can or you think you can. It's very difficult to do. So um, especially don't think about selling all of your assets because this is what we saw in 2008, 2009. People got out of the market and they just never got back in. It's always great to say, oh, I'll buy at a lower price. Chris, you and I have talked about this. Buy at a lower price. That's from an emotional side. That's very <laughs> that maybe hard today. To do. So right, and you just don't know when that is. So it's just it's just not worth it. If you need some capital, you need to raise some cash. That's one thing, but certainly don't think about liquidating your portfolio and getting it all out because you might not get back. Yeah, in. just to keep beating on a theme that I've apparently fallen in love with. If you look at the newspaper, uh, which existed at the time, any of the news stories from March tenth, two thousand and nine, they weren't good. There was no, there was no good news. It was how many banks are, this Friday are they going to be shutting down? You know what? It, there was nothing good. There was nothing that signaled the bottom of the market. So, yeah. trying to find that is you know is truly a fool's errand. Uh, keep the questions coming. We're going to get to the questions from the audience in just a moment. Um, also, these guys have a couple of stocks if you're looking to uh, do a little shopping and, and build a watch list. But one more bit of news from today I want to ask you about, and it has to do with dividend investors. Mm -hmm. um, Occidental mm -hmm. Petroleum coming out, cutting their dividend. First of all, they cut their dividend for the first time in 30 years. Second of all, they cut it by 86%. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't own shares of Occidental Petroleum. I'm guessing most people watching don't either, but we probably all have a dividend payer or two in our portfolio. Should we now be on watch for the capital allocation strategies of our businesses? Because 
This, this wasn't some fly-by-night company. This is a company that had a 30-year history of paying a dividend, and they slashed it to the bone today. Andy. They were worth, at one point, uh, well over $100 billion market cap, and now it's a $12 billion company. Well, and the stock's up today on that news because yeah. of the capital preservation. I mean, this, this was not unexpected. Chris, you and I talked mm. yesterday, and I, I know we've talked about this over the years, when you see the yields of some of these companies start to really increase be very careful about chasing that yield because that really you never trust them, right, yeah. Bill? Because that's a that's a that's a potential indication that a dividend cut will be coming. So for Occidental, they didn't. I don't don't think they really had a choice. Yes, they had this this great. They may have had this great history, but that's in the past. Yeah. They're facing a, an oil market, an energy market that's in real disruption, and the pricing of oil being so volatile, they just were worried more about the debt picture than they were the. The dividends they needed to preserve that. That's capital. exactly right. And so. you know, we talk about the reasons why you can point to the coronavirus. <laughs> you can point to the breakdown of the agreement between Saudi Arabia and Russia. But the reality, as with any commodity, what you're talking about is a tiny move in between the supply and the demand can cause the price to fall or rise as much as we did yesterday. Absolutely. You yeah. saw that when the big players start moving around, and that's yeah. going to have an impact on that, that commodity. Yeah. Uh, let's get to the stocks that you guys are watching right now. Andy, I'll, let me start with you. I like Okta. They reported earnings last week um, or maybe two weeks ago, Chris, and we talked about this on, on the radio show. It provides access management, um, secure login, mm. kind of like personal um, cloud management to allow more than 8,000 companies at an enterprise level help their employees, including here at The Motley Fool, manage their logging credentials. Um, and that that's much more complex than you might think. And yeah. Okta, built from the cloud, founded by Todd McKinnon, um, and owns a large amount of stock. And it's just a really impressive business, Bill, as we followed. Yeah. Um, the stock now is 20% off its highs, sells at about um, 115. Um, you, sells at less than 20 times sales, which um, for a cloud company, as we see these cloud multiples start to come down, and I think that's, Chris, as, as we've talked about, that's a that's a, a nice way to think about buying high quality companies. Growth rates north of 45%. Yeah. Um, not profitable, mm. they're free cash flow posi posi positive, and they are making money, but they're not um, gap earnings profitable. And I think some of the sell off recently, besides just concern in the wider market, is just some of the profitability picture. But when I look at the growth opportunity for helping just um, individuals manage all of their logins. Okta does it very well and it ties in with all these applications that allow a very seamless both onboarding and exiting process um, for companies. And I just think it's a really impressive operation. Yeah, fabulous company. And Bill, what about you? Uh, so I'm going right into the mouth of the beast and talking about a, J a Chinese e-commerce company called JD.com. Uh, JD.com is about a $50 billion market cap company. It's been, it, it's, it's been around uh, for uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, it actually got its start in China in the midst of the SARS epidemic. Uh, they had a number of, uh, they had a number of, online, of uh, physical stores and everything had to close. And so they immediately went to online and have grown like wildfire ever since. The, uh, you know, the company is, uh, what uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb might call anti-fragile. It's, you know, they have their own uh, system of mail. They don't trust the Chinese mail system. They have their own transportation. They have their own, uh, they, they have all of their own infrastructure. And it has actually done quite well during the shutdown in China. And I expect that habits will have been made now that will last a decade or more. Um, we're going to get to your questions in just a second. Again, check out that free report. You can go to fool.com slash start an investing starter kit to really get you off and running, and it comes with five more stocks from our investing team. And as always, if you're enjoying the video, please consider giving us a thumbs up. It helps other people find the video, and we like doing these videos. Yeah. Uh, a lot of great questions coming in. Um, Abby asking, should we buy Disney? Uh, Disney a stock, you go back to the beginning of the year, it's trading for about $150 a share, um, about $40 shaved off of that. Um, and I say this as a shareholder. Um, I, I understand the drop in the stock. Um, yep. As great as Disney Plus is, when you look at the parks being closed in China, um, the possibility of parks being closed in the U.S., um, uh, that's a big part of the business. The problem with Disney, the answer is yes, Disney <laughs> is quite cheap. But the, the big issue with Disney is that unlike a, lo a lot of other expenditures, when you're talking about travel, 
canceled travel usually isn't deferred. It's just canceled. So they are going to forego a fair amount of, of revenues, although my understanding uh, was that the, park in, the parks in Florida were absolutely full yesterday. So maybe not so much here in the U.S., but uh, the parks are still 30% of the cash flows for the company. So I do expect that there will be an impact there. But it, you know, you tell me what uh, the competitors to Disney are because I don't, I just don't know anymore what they would be. Uh, Jessica asks, uh, I just received an inheritance and was literally just about to start investing. I've got about 25 years before retirement. Should I invest in index funds now or just hold off? Uh, congrats on the God. inheritance. <laughs> wow. um, yeah. uh, I, I, I think we all think she should start investing now, but the question is, where do you start? Yeah, and congrats on thinking about investing. That's smart. There's lots of ways you could probably spend that money and sort of put it in the markets, especially when mm. you have 25 years. That's great. Uh, if you don't own stocks and you haven't been a stock investor, I think index funds are a great way to start. Chris, we talked about this yesterday, buying a little bit of the, just take the SPY, which is the S&P 500 widely owned index, just to get started. Mm -hmm. uh, it starts to diversify your portfolio. Start there. Um, sign up for a um, stock advisor at one of our services and start thinking about buying stocks. But I think starting with the index is a great spot to go. Don't worry. Again, same advice. Don't worry about timing the market getting in. Don't feel you have to but put it all in. But you've done it. I mean, that's... <laughs> well, don't feel you have to put it all in today yeah, or tomorrow. No, for sure. Just... Um, yeah. Especially if you're just starting out, just nibble a little bit, put a little bit here, set up a schedule, set up a process and yeah. stick to it. One thing I would say, and, and we talked about this back in January, is that even though the U.S. stock market has come down nearly 20%, at the, at the time before it started dropping, it was at historic highs, if you're measuring yeah. the S&P 500. One thing that I might recommend is mixing up uh, a mid-cap index fund. Uh, you know, there's an ETF, the ticker is MDY, which tracks some, the U.S. mid-caps, which were a little less pricey at the beginning and are much less pricey today. So that's, that's a good way to diversify as well. Yeah. Uh, Casper is asking, what are the biggest companies not directly in the path of the corona tornado uh, that could fall before this is over? And he gives us an example, Microsoft. Um, I like this question because it acknowledges something which we all know to be true, which is that anytime we see steep drops like this, there are really good businesses that are not nearly affected mm -hmm. in the way that, say, cruise lines or airlines would be mm -hmm. affected, and yet they get sold off maybe to a larger degree than they should. Tell me what Netflix's exposure is at the moment, and, you know, just for example. Yeah, I think that's um, all companies are going to get, uh, any large company in some way is probably going to get hit and somehow be affected by this because it's so widespread. And again, it's a medical and a health, not necessarily right now. It's not a financial, although it is and mm -hmm. will become more acute on the economic side. So, um, but I think owning some going in stocks that are down, Disney, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, these are all pulled back. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a little bit more stability, uh, the multiples are a little bit more reasonable than they were. I mean, Apple, um, the multiple had really expanded pretty dramatically over the last year and a half, two years before. You could buy, buy it at 12, 13 times, and then it got up to the mid-20s. So as those multiples pull back, feel free. I, I think that's a good way to think about investing. Yeah. But don't kid yourself. These companies, I mean, the, the Everything. COVID and coronavirus, yeah. that, that, I think you said hurricane or maybe tornado, tornado. is pretty wide, and it's going to hit a lot of the companies. Yeah. Some companies that may benefit uh, actually are ones you know like Square, which is pushing uh, contactless transactions. Mm -hmm. You think about think about some of the ways that you might you know you you might limit your own exposure, not necessarily to the virus, but to humanity. You know, and and so I think that there are actually some companies that that actually may benefit from a change, you know, from a permanent change in behavior. Yeah, a lot of the collaboration tools, Bill, we were talking yeah. about it last yeah. and early on, which offers Trello and And these are getting Jura. sold off, right? These yeah. are getting, I mean, if they are getting sold off, Zoom obviously is a, is, is a clear example, mm -hmm. which provides the video conferencing software that, that is, works so well. Um, but there are a lot of companies that, that will probably find as we continue to change the way that we work and we, and, and we interact, um, in the in the face of this coronavirus, um, that might last, but there might be 
ongoing changes for that bill, you were saying, like Alassian could be one. For possible. sure. Well, you mentioned Square. It's a nice reminder <coughs> that both Apple and Google have their own payment systems. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> one more reason to like Apple and Google, Apple Pay, Google Pay. That's right. Uh, Paul asks, how do you anticipate low mortgage rates affecting companies like Zillow and Redfin? Nice reminder that the 10-year treasury is um, just Start. barely above the floor. Yeah. Well, they're all below one. Now, for the first time, the yield curve, curve all dropped below 1%. That's incredible. incredible. 30 years below that. It just shows, below one especially the 10-year, just shows how afraid people are. Yeah, there, are there's a, just a lot of fear out there because there's so much money going into, into um, the, the treasury market. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. If we had been in an environment where any time over the last 10 years rates had been high, I would say, yes, obviously, this is going to bring about a whole lot more activity. The reality is that even in the last two years, rates have been at, at, at lows that would have seemed impossible even 10 years before. Yeah. So it'll, it'll spur some activity and might be beneficial for, for Redfin and Zillow, but I don't know that that's, that's really an expectation to have. We'll see it. We've already seen it on the refi market a little bit. Refis yeah, definitely, it's, it's, it's definitely, definitely hit their highs, yeah. right? But it is interesting, like in the face of um, big challenges, Consumers tend not to make big purchases, and a house is a is a big purchase. So I, I will be very interested to see. We are now coming into the prime selling season, or starting to ramp up there, and it'll be interesting to see how it impacts the real estate market yeah. on the consumer side. It will be interesting to watch, particularly as you know, as you said, we're coming into the prime selling season for homes, and at a time when mortgage rates are looking really, really attractive. Yeah, they are, and and it'll. Be, what I'm really fascinated in is to see how low the mortgage rates. As I mean, if you if you if you believe that the Fed is going to cut another um, 50, some are even calling for even more than that. Just basis throw it all out there. On, just get it all out. How low the mortgage rates will go relative to that? Historically, they've always been um, somewhere around I think like two percent higher than the 10-year, more or less. And mm -hmm. we'll see how low that. I'm works. waiting for someone to pay me for my mortgage. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's what I'm we're not far off from. Yeah. That. No, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, great question about portfolio <laughs> allocation from David, uh, who says I'm building a Roth IRA starting today. I have a 401k plan through work. I'm 37 years old. What percentage of the portfolio should uh, do you think should be in dividend stocks compared to growth stocks? Someone in his late 30s. Um, love that he's thinking this way in terms of portfolio allocation. A lot of times people think just in terms of industry diversification uh -huh. as opposed to dividend payers versus growth. And it's all retirement money? Is that, that's, that's what, what for when? Roth IRA. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'll just... Just to toss out a number, I'll say 75% growth, 25% dividend. I mean, there are a lot of great dividend growth kind of companies. They don't yield very much. I mean, yeah. MasterCard, Market Access, one that I like. Apple. I own, I own both Apple. those stocks. Yeah. Apple. Yeah. Uh, so there, there is dividend growth. They tend not to yield a lot, Bill, but they, but you can get that growth versus a company maybe like like Okta or JD or someone like that that you know is the. 30 Shopify, 30, 40 percent kind of grower. Uh, but I think. You, he has years ahead if he can stomach the volatility, even in his retirement accounts mm -hmm. that come with some of the growthier, I think the growth side is probably the way to go. Yeah, I think that that's probably the <coughs> case. I mean, you know, the, re the reality with dividend companies, by and large, is that they are more slow growers and, you know, they're stable. They would uh, they would play the same role or a similar low that role that like a bond portfolio would play, would pay in a more conservative portfolio. Yep. Uh, Michael asks, uh, how much cash are you holding on the sideline? The question of cash is always interesting to me because yeah. it is very much a personal decision. Uh, yeah. There are investors who like to be fully invested. Uh, there are investors who always want to make sure they've got that cushion of 5%, 10%, that sort of thing. Um, not to mention the strategies of how you get cash in your portfolio in the first place. Yeah. It can be through uh, dividend payments uh, or it can be through um, you know maybe a bonus at work that you decide that's how I'm going to fund it. Uh, first to his question, do you have a, a a hard and fast rule in terms of how much cash you want to have in I your take portfolio? any yeah I take any amount out that I think that I'm going to need over the next year so for example I'm assuming that I will have with two children an absolutely enormous payment to colleges and universities next year so that money is happily sitting in cash <laughs> at the moment um, just because there's no N not to paint myself as a you know as a timing genius, but there's you know there there's no reason to mess around with money that you yeah. that you need 
and you know you're going to need within the next year. Yeah, I'll even take it a little bit long. I'll say maybe three years. If you really yeah. need that capital I pushed for it. payment yeah. or whatever, like yeah. just be very careful with that. Um, I always just inside my portfolio in my, my main account right now, my non, non-taxable account is probably around 8%. Um, seven and a half, eight percent. I like to get that around ten percent if I can. I actually um, put some of that money to work in both stocks and some tax payments. Uh, so that's that's. I mean, that's just my personal. It's really a personal decision about your volatility bill. Most mutual funds might carry three yeah, percent, maybe very actively. Yeah, or mutual active. funds will tend don't to be carry fully a, a lot. They tend yeah. to be fully invested. And over the last ten years, as we saw from that chart, like you, you want to be invested in the stocks. I mean, the, to be more fully invested, but that, that, that cash does help with a little bit of volatility and does give you some opportunity to invest when you see stocks. I think that's the, I, that's the really important thing. I think people, people who are looking for, you know, who were worried about a pullback, and you, know, like, you have to remember that we are suffering from this pullback now, but we have remained in the market during the last five or six guaranteed pullbacks that didn't happen. Right. You know, 2013 coming into the year, everyone was, you know, every market, you know, wag was saying, well, it's gone too far. Right. Well, I mean, you've missed a double in the S&P since then. Yeah, so, good point. Yeah. Uh, Raj asking about Luck and Coffee, uh, a recent uh, Motley Fool recommendation. Um, is the current stock price the right entry point for Luck and Coffee? Have you actually had Luck and Coffee? I have actually. Oh, there you yeah. Go. Uh, for yeah, those unfamiliar, um, uh, an upstart uh, coffee company in China. Upstart Ch- coffee company in China with actually now thousands of outlets, and they five hundred outlets. Yeah, it's unbelievable. There'll be six thousand probably that by the end of this year. Yeah, and it, when you think of it, don't think of it maybe as like a, a you know a, they've, right. oh, they have an open twenty forty five hundred Starbucks. Everything from literally a self serve you know a self serve unit table. to yeah <laughs> absolutely tiny but ubiquitous. Um, they are. One of the, and, and, and I love, uh, my wife just called, I love my wife. Uh, <laughs> she wants you to bring her back some fucking coffee. For, for that anyone who's wondering whether or not this bill. is actually live. Yeah, there we go, thank live. you. Um, they are in some ways eating Starbucks lunch in, in China simply because Starbucks has been priced for a more foreign, you know, a, a, a more foreign price point. Uh, whereas Luckin, as you know, Luckin's price point is much more appropriate for half, theory. right? Basically, half. basically, kind of basically like half, half the price of. Co- uh, I said uh, that in thirty words. Thank you. Half. No, but yes, you were, you were right, and, that, yeah. and that, that's actually it's a very Chinese. It's it's born in China. It's a very Chinese focused company. It's a Chinese brand, and it's very tech centric. So um, it'll be it'll be exceptionally volatile. We'll see how it all plays out. I mean, we're seeing some good numbers coming out of China now when it comes to COVID-19 and the coronavirus mm-hmm. that is starting to slow down. That's the spread slow down. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a it's a it's a really interesting because it's so tech focused and um, it really uh, serves and data much, driven in terms of very data yeah. and serves a young audience and very data driven. The answer is yes. yes. I think well, I was going to say to Raj's point. I mean, you uh, yes, it's um, it been kind of a volatile stock, but just year to date. Uh, it's basically where it was yeah. on January 1st. Yeah. So it's, you know, trading in the high 30s. Yeah. Um, we've seen plenty of stocks both in and out of China that have been punished a lot more than yeah. that. Yeah, I w- oh, yeah. Sorry, Bill, go ahead. I was going to say, I would assume that their next earnings report will be terrible. I mean, it just yeah. almost has and to be. And that might even be priced into the stock. Yeah. Uh, the fact is that when you look at the next five, ten years, I mean, like, just the consumption, the, the coffee consumption market, all three of us like coffee, but mm-hmm. the consumption patterns in China are only improving, and the penetration of coffee drinkage in China is just so much less than, not just the U.S., but also what you see in Hong Kong and, and other um, Asian countries. So uh, there's a lot of room for that market to expand and grow, and Luckin is taking bits and parts of it. Yep. Starbucks came out with their same store sales uh, for China for February, down 78% yeah. in China. So there you go. Did they say why? I think you know. They blame. <laughs> um, question from Nick asking, is this a good time to shift to buying bond funds? Uh, we focus on stocks here at The Motley Fool. Um, is this a good time to I, look at bond been funds? So, um, I, I, uh, 
I'm not a bond fund investor, so I don't want to say no. I will say there has just been, if you look at most of the money flow, especially at the individual level, over the last 10 years, a lot of it, a majority of it, has actually gone into the bond market. Just a ton of money gone in there um, as we've seen these yields just go down and down and bond prices go up. Yeah. Um, bond prices or bond funds can have a place in someone's portfolio, especially if you're maybe close to retirement and you need a little bit more stability. They're not immune to falling. They can fall. No, yields are so low because, yeah, be, because the price on them is so high. That's right. Yeah. So they've just done, and the bond funds have done very well, tended to have done very well. Uh, so if it fits that part of your portfolio, I think, okay, uh, especially if you're into retirement. But if you are, um, you know, just starting out, like we talked to some of the other people who send in questions, you know, um, I think still equity is the place to be. Yeah, but if you are in retirement and you're scared out of your wits, then by all means, like just, yeah. you know, put it into something more secure until you can sleep at night. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Maria asks, which AI stocks would you recommend? Uh, artificial intelligence, um, maybe immune to the coronavirus? Uh, I, I don't think, again, I don't think anything is necessarily immune. Um, there's certainly a lot of good companies that are benefiting from, from the, 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 the push towards AI. We have a whole service dedicated to AI yeah. stocks. So um, I don't know, I have to think about which ones might benefit the most in that space. Um, well, to go back to the point earlier, you were talking about Square and I mentioned Apple, um, yeah. Google, they've got their own payment systems. I mean, uh, just as uh, Peter Lynch says, sometimes the best idea is already in your portfolio. I mean, that's one of the advantages of businesses like Apple and Alphabet, right? Like they've already got, in part because of their enormous cash hoards, yeah. they've got the ability to make the investments into AI. Well, yeah, and a, a, um, a company that I've just always respected that is actually pretty volatile and has certainly had its ups and downs, and I think long term, will continue to do very well as NVIDIA with its chips and where their focus, especially as you think about how we are all using technology and yeah. how we will use technology. Um, and the stock got, when they came out, um, the stock did very well around the cryptocurrency that's right. mining. And when yeah. that fell off, the stock just got clobbered. So that's when I think when it comes to um, buying on a pullback, um, when you're thinking about the long-term investment possibility, that's very attractive. And I think that that's, I mean, in, you know, to your point, that's probably one that most people who are interested in AI, a lot of people already own. Yeah, that's probably uh, true. Yeah. yeah. And then of course, like you said, Microsoft, mm -hmm. um, uh, Alphabet, Google are going to continue to benefit from that yeah. work as well too. Um, question from Sweta, who asks, any suggestions for ETFs, exchange traded funds, um, Probably safe to say we like those, uh, or we're bigger fans of those than we are necessarily of bond funds. Yeah, we talked about two earlier. We talked about the spies, and we also talked about the mid cap, uh, the mid cap ETF, which is uh, ticker MDY, mm -hmm. and that gets you an exposure to the U.S. market in a way that's uh, that's a little uh, in a part of the market that hasn't gone as well over the last five years as, you know, the S&P 500. Uh, there's, a, there's an absolutely uh, a, a great uh, international fund uh, called, the ticker is WRLD, which tracks the MSC, MSCI Global. That's good as well. I think ETFs can be a great investment to help you get started and diversify a little bit. A lot of us use that at various times um, and for, for different reasons. So again, if you're just starting out, ETFs can be a great investment as long as you just um, understand what you are buying. Because that's the real trick with some of the ETFs, especially as you get more niche. Yeah. You might think you are buying um, a, a country fund or this kind of specific industry, and actually, when you look underneath the holdings, you're not actually getting what you yeah, think that's you exactly are. So right. that's but with the spy, you don't worry about that. And some of the larger ETFs. Uh, Dan asking, should I wait for Boeing to drop under two hundred dollars a share to invest? For context, Boeing one year ago was trading at four hundred dollars a share. Mm -hmm. The seven thirty seven Max uh, problem has dragged on. Um, if they have a solution to it, they haven't revealed it yet. Uh, today, trading at $223 a share. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have a lot further, but I think back to the comments uh, that each of you have made about trying to time the bottom. Uh, You're talking about 10%. Right. Yeah. No. No, don't wait. Uh, I mean, if you, if you believe that there's a reason, and once again, Boeing's next earnings announcement is going to be awful. Right, but it's not. It's probably not something that's going to surprise people. 
I don't see any reason if it's a company that you want to own for the long term, why you would not put at least half of what you eventually would like to own today in, into it at this price. Say what you want about Boeing, it is part of a duopoly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unlike cruise ships, I mean, there's some talk today about, about uh, you know, the federal government providing relief to the airlines. This is an industry that is entirely necessary. So it is going to be supported and that will help. Boeing. You're saying the cruise industry is not necessary? I, I was hoping you wouldn't come back with, yeah. The also thing about Boeing is it's probably selling at a three year low at this point right now. Yeah. And they're certainly hit by what's happened with, um, with internally with their challenges, <laughs> but also with the coronavirus. So um, it's also fairly diversified into other parts of the business mm -hmm. and serving lots of different clients, including the U.S. government. So um, I agree with Bill. Like, I don't think you have to wait for that one. I wouldn't. Uh, Laura asks, would you recommend buying more of Shopify now? Which would seem to indicate that Laura owns Shopify Love that. already. Yeah, as do I. Um, Shopify has gone from being fantastically expensive. I think the high, I'm going to call it without looking, was something like 52 times sales. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, Maybe which even is, higher than that which is remarkable for any yeah. company, much less one that was at $60 billion in market cap. Uh, it's now substantially lower. It's lower by about 25%, yeah. which means that it is simply s expensive. Um, but it's- But worth it. I mean, like that, that is a business it, yeah. that is that is that has justified, it's earned the multiple. Um, yeah. You know, again, it could go down to, 350. I mean, there's no like, there's no. It doesn't automatically always have to go up, and just because yeah. you buy it doesn't mean that it's going to go up. Yeah. So I think, but that that's a business that you want to just be able to buy a little bit, add more, um, and just own for the long term. Yeah, you that's just really have to. Solid know, business. Yeah, you just have to know that even at current valuation, the market is expecting an awful lot yeah, of, of, that's right. of Shopify. That's right. But what, what's Warren Buffett's line? You know, we like to buy great companies at a good price. Like, you know, it, yeah. rare is the occasion you're gonna buy a great company at an incredibly cheap price. Right. right. Well, yeah. More yeah. Um, Penny asks, what about buying shares of Teladoc or other virtual healthcare companies? Uh, I think Andy, yesterday one of the things we talked about was United Healthcare, mm -hmm. um, Teladoc, uh, great telemedicine business. United Healthcare, a giant in the industry, uh, they've got their own telemedicine solution as well. Yeah, and telemedicine is again when you just get when you get past the coronavirus and the condition we have right now, you just look at how we are going to evolve in with medicine and mm -hmm. with doctor visits, and, and telemedicine is going to be a big driver of that. So, uh, Teladoc has obviously gotten a lot of support in the stock market because of of the fears over the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So there might be a, I would not, I would not be surprised at all to see that one um, at various times just show that more of the downside volatility than it has uh, recently just because of the coronavirus. But again, long term, we were supporters of that um, before the coronavirus and we no. still are. Teladoc and uh, in the education sector, Grand Canyon Education, I think are two very interesting potential companies to benefit long term from the changes in behavior that are going to come from yeah. this. But they are in fairly competitive industries and they've got some pretty big, well, you know, well, well healed competitors. They may not ultimately win, but I think it, that it's a really, really, you know, it's a great way to think about how, you know, where these segments of commerce are going. Yeah, and they're different. I mean, Teladoc is much more niche, of course, United Health. It's yeah. much more diversified as most of their uh, yeah. profits coming from. I thought you meant the Grand Canyon. I was like, no, sorry, yeah, the yeah, same. exactly. <laughs> no, sorry, a little misplaced modifier there. So those to get to the specific question, as we were talking about United Health, um, large cap, much more stable, but has a, a lot of um, potential to be in the political crosshairs this year. Uh, two questions related to the price of oil. Martina asking, what should we do with oil stocks, invest or not? And Britt asking, do you have any airline stock suggestions with the price of oil going down? Uh, let's start with Martina's question. Uh, that, as much as anything, appears to be the case for buying oil stocks right now, which is, holy cow, they're cheap. Yeah, I, I, I struggle with companies that have their ultimate, their ultimate value is geopolitical and based on commodities and oil, oil has both of those in spades. So, I, you know, do you remember that, you know, when oil was $120 a share and we were at peak oil and everything, it was going to go to $500 and now apparently no one's ever going to use any oil ever again. And it's, 
you know, it's a it's a great question. It's not, you know, I'm not sure that I would trust anyone to answer. I it. think, and that's the, <clears throat> for me, the question is one of trust. When you think about those that the, the dividends they have, we saw Occidental cut the mm -hmm. dividends. They won't be the they they may have been the first, but they certainly won't be the last. Yeah. Um, the, you have to be very careful, Chris, as we talked yesterday when you start going into some of the drillers and some of the pure play because um, they're so heavy levered, yeah. very heavy levered. Uh, and could have um, some really significant challenges with their debt picture. So, so be very careful around that. As far as the airlines go, uh, I mean, you could be seeing some really um, bargains here with, um, I think Southwest and Delta are probably uh, the two that, that we own in, in, in yeah. the discovery services and probably favor. Uh, but there's just gonna be a lot of disruption as we talked about in the next few months. So I wouldn't be surprised if we haven't seen the lows there. Yeah, I think that that's probably true, but also they do, uh, all of the airlines, I believe all of them, uh, buy their jet fuel using forward. That's and right. I can imagine that yeah. they are all very, very active yeah. right now. Yeah, I wonder, it'll be very interesting to see, we talked about this on another channel, what we've talked about, uh, Warren Buffett over at Berkshire Hathaway, just talking about Stocks are too expensive, can't buy, mm -hmm. can't buy anything, and now... Um, as $120 seeing, billion dollars sitting on the sideline. And, we'll just yeah. see what he... I mean, he wants to make these big investments. You have companies mm -hmm. like Southwest, Moody's, which they, they own um, significant shares of, and whether um, they... Not just buying the shares, but maybe taking outright um, bid for the company. Yeah, yeah. for all the talk we've been doing about uh, cash on the sidelines, uh, nice reminder that Warren Buffett really has the most cash on well, the sidelines. Well, not just on the sidelines. <laughs> and, and that he is publicly looking to deploy it. And yeah. they just generate a lot of cash from their operating businesses yeah. that go right into their pockets, but then also they have the float from the insurance business as well, too. So they have lots of levers to be able to invest, which is why on Fool.com we published an article, uh, I think it was Matt Franco published an article that Berkshire's in a pretty good position here. Mm -hmm. It's It's not been a great, uh, and I own Berkshire, it's one of my That's larger positions, yeah. but it's, you know, it's, the stock has not done do super well over the past couple of years. It's just been a little bit more of a laggard, but this is the kind of market yeah. where where um, they, he really shines. Some very smart oil investors. I, I feel like we gave that answer a little bit of a short shrift. Uh, some very smart oil investors that I know of have said that they don't expect all of the companies to survive, that there's going to yeah. be some real pain and that will cause additional problems to ripple through, but that the oil patch is almost unbelievably cheap right now. By so. the way, market's up 4% right now. So we should keep we talking. Go. We should keep talking. We're doing doing. And okay. Boeing's gone up since we talked about it too. <laughs> uh, this is, we are magic. Yeah, You're welcome, America. Yeah, that's right. We're going to stay here we're until everything's. Made. <laughs> um, and yet, I was just about to say. Final question before we wrap up. Um, <laughs> we can't leave. Matt asking, uh, what are your thoughts on Twilio? Oh, I own Twilio. I still like it. The stock's kind of struggled here a little bit. As they kind of for those unfamiliar with the business, uh, it does. It uh, sounds made up. I'll be it, honest. It sounds made up. Um, it does like um, in-app communication, so mm -hmm. it's really tied to helping. Um, so, for example, Netflix um, when you get or communications Uber, or yeah. Uber when you get communications through your phone through an app, they really specialize in that. They made an, a large acquisition of SendGrid for three or four billion dollars, which brings email into their mm -hmm. into their uh, portfolio. So they're trying di digesting that. And the stock's kind of struggled here a little bit. More, uh, multiple's gotten a little bit um, more accessible um, and, and a little bit more reasonable. So I still own Twilio and I still believe in it. Yeah, they had uh, they had some actual real uh, self-inflicted missteps this last uh, this last quarter. And um, it's a company that you know it 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 is a. It's an incredibly well-run company. I always remain nervous for uh, for for an application like this that it would be too easily um, sidestepped and disrupted. Oh, yeah. But nothing's come nothing's come along as of yet. Yeah, and it's founded by a bunch of guys from the University of Michigan. So there you go. Oh, short of that. that. Yeah, get out. <laughs> Says proud Michigan alum right. Andy Cross. All right, Andy Cross, Bill Mann, guys. Thank you, thanks Chris. for being here. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Again, check out our free investing starter kit. You can find it at fool.com slash start. Everything to get you started investing and five additional stock ideas from our investing team. Uh, we're going to be back here on Thursday with Motley Fool co-founder David Gardner taking your questions, so check that out. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on Thursday. Gonna sing for my supper and get my groove on. I still know how to have fun. I need checks. I need balances. Life's a mess. 
with financial challenges, checks and balances. When things get tough, do you do it for money or do you do it for love? Cheapskate always has a headache. 